I just can't help but to praise God for the gospel. And that's what we're going to spend the majority of our time on this morning. Um, the gospel obviously means the good news. Um, and it is good news. You know, no matter what news we receive in life, for those of us who, who have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have good news all the time. The best news of which is that this is not our home. This is not where we belong. This is not where we need to get frustrated at the world and the things the way the world is going. In a lot of ways, honestly, the way I see our nation going and our world going makes me more and more excited. In particular, as I look at the book of Revelation and I see the things that must come to pass, that my Savior can come and get me. It is good news. It's good news not only because of our future, but it's good news because of our present. It's good news because of our present, because we have a Savior who cares dearly for us and who allows us to call on His holy name at any given moment to be our strength. I've shared with each one of you at different points in, in, in my life, in my walk, and in my ministry here that my favorite, one of my favorite stories in all the Gospels is the story of Peter when he's walking on the water. And we're all pretty familiar with that story. And if you're not, hopefully you get a chance to read that. But Peter, is, they're, they're, the disciples are out in the boat, boat and the, it's stormy out and the weather's bad. And Peter steps out of the boat. Well, actually, before Peter steps out of the boat, they see Jesus walking on the water to him. And he says, fear not, it is I. And they take comfort in that. Peter says, if it's you, Lord, bid me to come. So Peter steps out of the boat and he gets onto the water and he starts walking to the Savior. Now, that's beauty in of itself, that with Christ in our presence, we can walk on water. But the story goes on, and it says that Peter got distracted by the waves, how big they were, and how, how temptuous the weather was, and how difficult the task looked to have to walk over these waves that were just coming down and crashing, and, and undoubtedly scared the heck out of Peter. He was upset with that, and he took his eyes off his Lord, it says, because he got scared. And it says he began to sink. Now this is the part of the story that has always comforted me the most. When you read that story, nowhere in that story does it say how far Peter sank. It doesn't say that. Now me personally, if I'm walking on water, the minute there's water above my toes, I'm a little freaked out. But we don't know how far he sank. How distracted was he? Did it get to his ankles? His knees, his waist, his chest, perhaps it was to his chin. We don't know. But what we do get is the very next thing, which it says, when Peter cried out, immediately the Lord was there to help him. That is good news. That is good news. We who have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ can immediately cry out, and our Savior is there to help us. Let's read. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, right now we ask that you would come and speak to us. Speak to us through your word. And by your servant, Lord, let these words not be my own, Lord, but may they be by your spirit. May you write these things upon our heart. May we glean from these and may we grow from these, Lord. I thank you for each one that is present, Lord Father. And may you enrich their lives, Lord, as we learn more of your good news, your gospel, whom we received through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we now pray. Amen. We last week studied Paul, a servant, a bond servant, a chosen servant of Jesus Christ, called, separated out to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. 
Now, we all have been called to the gospel of God. We've all been called to that. You can study that in the scriptures. There's one thing that every believer should be, and that is a, is, is a testimony of the gospel of Christ. But Paul, because he studied on Gamaliel, I think had a little more assurance of this good news than sometimes we allow ourselves. And definitely what the, the time he was facing allowed. In verse 2 of chapter 1, it says, This gospel of God which had been promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, which was made the seed of David according to the flesh. So we see that this gospel that Paul preached, this gospel which we preach, this gospel which we have, this good news afore mentioned in the Old Testament. Um, we occasionally, and I think this might be one of the years we're going to do it, but we take the young people and we, uh, we do a Passover Seder. And now what a Passover Seder is, is, basically it is doing the Passover, but it's obviously with the understanding that the Messiah has come. And we show them how, and honestly, I don't know how you could go through the Passover Seder and not understand that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. But we had the Jews missing it for years. We had the, the Gentiles missing it for years. And in all honesty, I want you to understand that the gospel of God started in the very beginning. Now, when I mean in the very beginning, I mean, yes, we can actually go back and st start in the beginning if we wanted to. But the first, the first reference I want to take a look at this morning is in Genesis chapter 3. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, we know the fall of man. We spent month, weeks going over that with Pastor. I want to look here now at what happens after the fall of man. Just look with me, if you would, at verses 20, at verses 20 and 21 with me. Genesis chapter 3, Adam called his wife named na name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and his wife... Did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them? And the Lord said, no, keep, keep going. And the Lord said, Behold, this man has become one of us to know good and evil. And now let me put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat of the, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. There in the fall of man we see the gospel. Maybe you missed it as I was going over it, but did you notice that it said the Lord gave them coats of skin? It didn't say that they made their own coats of skin. And by the way, I want you to also notice that the Lord was very specific, specific to say, he wasn't an ocean, he was specific. He was specific to say, Adam and his wife he made coats for. It's a gospel that is a personal sense. Now, why is that the gospel? Because he made coats of skin for them. Do you know what that means? That means that because of the very first sin, something had to die. Something had to die to cover them, to cloak them, to give them tunics of skin. We don't necessarily know what those tunics were made out of. We don't know what animal it came from, but we know that it was of skin. Which really brings to remembrance Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm taking a marathon, guys. Flip back to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Looking at verses 19 through 22. The apostle writing says this. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and of the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels in the ministry. And almost all things are by law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. In the very garden, we see that something had to shed its blood for the remission of sins. Now, that doesn't mean that, 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 that by killing something that you're forgiven. All right? We know our forgiveness now came through the death of Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God. 
But what we can understand is that even then in the garden, God established that for men's sin, blood must be shed. The gospel began right there. The gospel began right there. But lest we think we need to perform sacrifices to be saved, I want to take a look at something very, very instructive and important to us. Turn to Genesis chapter 7. For most of us who may be familiar with our Bible, you'll understand we're turning to the story of Noah. Genesis chapter 7. And we're just going to look at two verses here. We could go through the whole story this morning and, and talk about how God, uh, well, first of all, God chose Noah because of his righteousness. He was perfect in his generations. In other words, because of his faithfulness is why God chose Noah. But look at verses 15 and 16. It says, And they went into, unto the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is breath of life. And they that went in, went in, male and female, all of which the Lord had commanded them. I think I gave myself the wrong verse reference here, guys. Sorry. No, I'm right. Okay, sorry. Um, and they went in, male and female, all flesh of God, and commanded him, and the Lord, and that's right, and the Lord shut him in. Do you get that? One of the things that I'm excited about that new movie that's coming out about Noah, right? I, I love it when, they, when, when, the, when, when we get biblical movies. Because even if they get some of the things wrong, it gives us a major po talking point and opportunity to share the gospel. Right? But one of the things I have to say, one of the reasons I'm excited about seeing the, the, the movie Noah is because I'm really excited to see who closes the door. Because right here it tells us that God closed the door. Now I want to make this clear and understandable for you right now. What was the work Noah did to be saved? He placed his faith in God and he entered into the ark. God closed the door. God preserved him. By the way, if you study the windows, they probably weren't even big enough for Noah to crawl out of. Right? Once Noah was in the ark, he was going anywhere until God opened the door for him. He was shut in. This is good news because it's the same for us. Once we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it says he puts us in hand and no man can take us out. Nobody gets to take us out. By the way, guess who falls into that category of no man? You yourself. You yourself. You part of that no man people. And that means that once the Lord closes the door behind us, we're safe in the ark. The only time that door came open was when that ark came to rest on what was to be the promised land. Then the Lord opened the door and let Noah out. Once we're safe in the hands of our Savior, the only time we're going to get out of that hand, and really we're never really going to get out of it, but the only time we get to come for forth from there is when we enter into the promised land. What a beautiful gospel. Even in the Old Testament, the Lord was taking care of it. I, I, I love that the Spirit was so expressed to say the Lord shut him in. How many people have all of their life probably thought that Noah shut the door? No, God did. By the way, just a side note, I think there's a reason for that. And this is instructive to us about the gospel as well. I think if Noah had access or been able to shut the door or open the door, I think that his compassion for mankind would have made him open the door to try to get more people in when he saw what was happening. I really do believe that. No, the righteous man. I don't know how a righteous man could hear the screams of mothers bewailing their children dying and not take compassion. I don't know how a righteous man could not hear his neighbors, perhaps his friends, and even those who mocked him in scorn, crying for help and not take him in. See, God is in control of that, guys. But this is also instructive. Noah ministered. He preached it. He told them what was coming. Are you? I've got to tell you, one of the biggest fears I have in my walk with Christ is this one thought. 
is that one day I will stand at the judgment seat of me, the throne judgment of my Savior. And I will be safely in the ark, if you would, with my Savior. And I will see my neighbor or my friend walk up to receive his judgment. And the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty, look at him and say, no, to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And for that person to look at me and say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? One of the saddest things that ever happened to me once I became a believer, and I came and moved back to Pocatello, the Lord brought me back to Pocatello after getting saved in Sin City. One of the main, most amazing things that happened to me was when I went to a church and I saw people I went to school with who said they'd been a believer their whole life. They never told me. Now I understand that's God's timing and I praise God for that, but I don't ever want to be guilty of that. Noah preached it, but God shut them in so that Noah wouldn't try to get another way for people to get in. Just like we need to preach it, but God will make the decision for the hearts of men. We don't get to try to drag them in. It's a choice they make. Sorry, going down the wrong path for myself this morning. We do not perform this saving work. We don't perform the saving work that needs to secure our own salvation even. It is the work in the hand of God which doth preserve our very life as it did Noah's in the ark. Now these are just two examples I've chosen this morning from the Old Testament without even really examining the prophets as, the, as, our, as, our, as, our, as, as our, our passage this morning says. But we will look at some. Let's start by looking at Psalm chapter 22. If you've never read Psalm 22, this is one of the ones you should have marked in your Bible. I use this one oftentimes when I'm sharing the gospel with people. Actually, the next two passages we're going to look at, I do. Psalm 22. And I'm going to read the whole thing, so just bear with me if you would. Because it is so amazing. Psalm 22. It starts out and it says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Okay, we're going to pause there for a second. We know a gospel that started that way, don't we? When our Savior was nailed to the cross and he cried out, why, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So if we run into that in Psalm 22, about a thousand years before our Savior, we should probably pay attention. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. In the night season I am not silent, but thou art holy. And thou inhabit the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of all of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn and shoot out the lip. They shake their heads saying, he that trusted in the Lord... He trusted on the Lord that he should, would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Again, is not exactly what they said to our Savior on the cross. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou did make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bowls have compassed me. Strong bowls of Bashan have beset around me. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. joint. My, whack, my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, and the symbol of wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them, and they cast lots upon my vesture. Be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. 
Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I will praise thee. Yet that the fear of the Lord praise him, all ye the seed of Jacob. Glorify him and fear him, all ye seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee. And the great congregation, I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and, this, and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is of the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come, and they shall declare his righteousness, righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. Uh, another way of translating that last verse, he hath done this in the Greek, will be tetelestai, or it is finished. The same thing our Savior closed with. Now notice right there in the middle, we read the description of the cross, did we not? We read where it said that his heart melted. And I don't mean to get vulgar this morning, but I don't know how many of you guys have ever studied or looked at what crucifixion does to a human body. First of all, the point of crucifixion was it was supposed to be designed in the most torturous ways a person could die. Because here's what it does. First, it does not break a bone. It does pull the body out of joint. Just as it said right there. It dries you out. We remember our Savior crying out for he thirsts. And what happens is the way they put the angle at the 45 degrees for the feet to stand on and the angle they put the arms at, you only had two choices if you were trying to rest while you were on the cross. One was to push against that nail that was driven between your feet to push up and get a breath or to pull up with your arms and try to get a breath. You were suffocating. Now, lack of oxygen, and I'm not a doctor, but I've done a little bit of research on this, and I'm trusting the men who have told me this, but lack of oxygen begins to make the blood separate. Which is why the heart, when they pierced it, flowed with water and blood. I mean, it is a horrible, horrible thing to die, the crucifixion. But here we have a direct prophecy of the Messiah in the Old Testament. The gospel of the Old Testament. How do we know it's the gospel? Because as he goes on in that, you'll notice that he starts talking about the meek inheriting the earth. All the nations shall come to him at the end of that passage. And at one point, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you see that right here in Psalm 22. Thousand years before our Savior. Now that's prophecy. By the way, um, just, just a side note, the, the, this is the thousand years before, before our Lord came. Crucifixion wasn't even invented. It was invented by the Persians, but it wasn't even invented until somewhere between 300 and 400 B.C. So give or take 600 years before crucifixion was even invented, our Lord described it. It was spoken of of the prophets, what would happen to our Messiah. And there's good news in that. And there's good news in there for you and I. Even in the psalm, it talks about, for the kingdom of the Lord, and he is the governor among the nations. And right before there, he says, and all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Do you realize that right there is our gospel, where he says he's coming to get us? Not just Israel, but all the nations. That's good news. That's good news that even, even in the Old Testament, and I want you to understand that this morning, brother and sister, because I want you to understand we were not an afterthought. We were not an afterthought. Sometimes people think that Israel was God's first choice and we were his second choice. No, we were not an afterthought. He thought of us before then. He knew us before then and wanted us before then. We weren't an afterthought. We weren't the, the consolation prize, if you would. We were what he came for, along with his people. Now flip over to Isaiah chapter 53. We're all pretty familiar with this one. 
Isaiah 53. Picking up at verse 1, we're not going to read through the whole passage this morning, just in the interest of time. Well, maybe we will. All right, Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should de desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and he is hid, it were, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sor sorrows, yet we, did, we, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Actually, I'm going to pause there this morning, guys. When you get the chance, maybe even this afternoon, go finish reading that passage. Do you see the gospel there? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. That is amazing to me. The Lord's saying that, hey, your peace is because of what he did. That's good news. That's the gospel. That is the gospel. That we have the good news of what our Savior has done for us, even in the Old Testament, lest we think that it was a New Testament idea. That we were going to be redeemed by him, and through his suffering we would be redeemed. We could spend all day looking over these things. But I mentioned the Passover in opening this morning. And I just want to share one little snip, snip bit, if you'll allow me to, from the Passover. Something, something that sometimes I think we may overlook in the Passover. Now, we're familiar with the Passover, wasn't if you're not, I'm going to give you a brief history here. Basically, Israel had been afflicted by the Egyptians, they were slaves. And Moses was sent down to the land. He went and he said, set my people free. Let my people go. Pharaoh's back and forth with him. Pharaoh's, yeah, go ahead and go. Changes his mind. He gets afflicted. More and more plagues come along. And more and more, and more, and more diseases and pestilences come along. Until finally the Lord says, that's it. I've had enough. This last plague, this last affliction will be the death of the firstborn. I'm going to kill all the firstborn. If, they don't let, if he doesn't repent of his ways. So at first, Pharaoh again, go. But he changed his mind. And I want you to see the instructions the Lord gave to Moses. Um, if you want to turn there, it's in Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And I first want to look at verses 5 through 7. This is the Lord speaking unto Moses. He tells them they're supposed to take a lamb into their house and they're supposed to take care of it for a while, which to me I think is also instructive of the fact that, that, I mean, you guys know what it's like to have a pet. Each one of you probably at one point or another had a pet in your life, right? And though sometimes that pet drives you crazy because it does things like, I don't know, claw up the, the couch that you love so dearly because you just paid a bunch of money for it, right? Or perhaps it sits on it while you're out of the house. <laughs> Right? And bring sandy feet onto it. And when you sit down, it drives you crazy. I am not by any means talking about my animals. <laughs> all right? But we all had pets. And you know what? Even though they may drive you nuts, you love them, don't you? Right? Let's be honest. You love them. Well, can you imagine bringing in a lamb, a baby, into your house with your children for days to be cared for and taken care of? To only have to slaughter it in front of them? Can you imagine going home this afternoon? And by the way, I don't want anybody doing this. But can you imagine going home this afternoon and killing your pet? This is what the Lord instructed them to do. And then he says in verse 5, Your lamb shall be without spot, with blem without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep and from the goats. And ye shall keep it. And by the way, it had to be a male. But we'll, that's another point. And ye shall keep it until the 14th day in the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two sides of the door and the post of the house wherein they shall eat. 
Now jump down with me, with me if you would to verse 21. This is Moses giving the instructions to the people of Israel. That was God giving the instructions to Moses. This is Moses re, re point, re, remaking this point. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said unto them, this is verse 21, draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lentil and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of this house until the morning. Now, a hyssop, I don't have a hyssop. I have a paintbrush. But a hyssop is a lot like a paintbrush. What it was, was a bunch of branches tied together. All right, now these aren't branches, obviously. This looks like it's probably horse hair and it's really dusty. But, um, but it was kind of like this. Now, what's important is he says to strike. All right? To strike the door. That word in the Hebrew, if we were to take a look at that, tells you it should be a violent motion. That's the idea of striking. All right? Going. No, rather, they're to dip it. Now, this is just on a stain the carpet. Okay? But they were to take the hyssop and dip it. They're first of all to strike the lentil. Now, as you can see, hopefully somewhat, the water continues to run, doesn't it? And then they're supposed to do this two side posts the same way. They're supposed to strike it and strike it. Now, in case you can't see it, I'll tell you what that makes. A cross. Even in the Passover, was the cross spoken of? Even in the Passover, was our Savior instructing us as to how he was going to die. How they miss it, I don't know. To strike it. But this is only the first part of the gospel that is described to us. We've spoken now about the death on the cross. And that is good news. Because without that, there is no remission. There is no repentance from our sins. We don't get covered by the blood of Jesus Christ without that. Right? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 15, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4 said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, what I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory that I preached unto you, unless you had believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. There's more to this gospel. He rose again. This, I, I, it, it's to take back up. And we know we can read in other passages where the Lord, it says, Jesus took up his own life. He raised himself. He was God Almighty and he did it. Now this is important to us because we kind of understand that just the cross alone is not the gospel. Many of us spend our time on the cross and that's a beautiful thing and it's a thing for us to remember and it's a humbling thing and we should be brought to tears as we think about what our Savior went through on the cross. But that is not all the gospel. Because without the resurrection, there is no gospel. He must rise again. He had to rise again. It's imperative that we understand this to understand the gospel. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 15, excuse me. I think we're just where I quoted from. We're going to look at a different passage out of there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're coming up on the Easter season. We should understand the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And now I want to take a look at verses 13 through 21. If you'll follow along with me, please. 13 through 21. It says, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ not ri is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Let me pause there for a second. If Christ isn't risen, I shouldn't be here today, and neither should you. All right? Let me just put that in simple vernacular. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, I mean, it's a beautiful thing that Christ died on the cross, but if he did not rise again, we are here in vanity. And he goes on from there. Verse 15. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. 
Sorry. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be the dead, is not, dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain. Yea, are yet in your sins. Let me pause there for a second. Do you understand without the resurrection, we're still condemned? The cross is a wonderful thing, guys. And we, we know that the gospel tells us, and the apostles tell us that, that, that the preaching of the cross is foolishness under the perishing. And it is. But the part of the preaching of the cross is not to stop at the cross. It is to understand that he had to be risen because if he wasn't risen, then you're not forgiven your sins. Verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we of all men are the most miserable. In other words, if the only hope we have is the fact that Christ died on the cross, and that's a beautiful thing, then we're miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Okay, I said that very softly. I imagine the apostle, when he's thinking this in his head, is saying, but now Christ is risen from the dead. And become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Christ is risen. And we have hope. That is the gospel. That he died for our sins, bled on a cross, on a device of torture, and that he was buried and he rose again. That is hope. That is the gospel. It is so important we understand the resurrection and the importance of it. Because the gospel itself declares the very deity of our Savior in it. Look at our passage this morning. Turn back to our passage this morning in Romans. I know you thought, we're we ever going to be back in Romans? Yes, we are, right now. All right? Look at our passage this morning. Look what it says there. Just jump ahead of me if you would. It says that, we, the, uh, verse 2, it says that they promised the four of the prophets, the Holy Scriptures, talking about the gospel, Jesus, the son of David. And look at verse 4. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of resurrection by resurrection from the dead. Where does the power of our Savior come from? It comes from his resurrection. It comes from his resurrection. We must have the resurrection to have the power of God in us. How are you to be raised from the dead? How are you to be taken care of? There are many, 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 sadly, sad to say, there are many, many, many religions out there that are putting their hope in a man that's bones still lie in a grave. But not us. Not us. No, our Savior's risen. He came back. And He stands today in heaven. And He takes up testimony for His, for his Father for you today. When the enemy comes and accuses you, He says, uh-uh, I don't think so. That's mine. This is what our Savior is doing today. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Just like Peter was not left alone to fall, but needed just yet just to cry out, so do we. So do we. Now, the genealogy itself testifies of who our Savior is. The Messiah had to be of the, of the lineage of David. And we see in verse 3 there that it says he was of that. He was of that. And we could spend all day looking at the genealogy of Christ. Um, and we know that it, from both his earthly parents, if I can put it that way, as it was supposed, it says in the scriptures, Joseph, his father. And of course, we know Mary, his mother. Both were from David. Uh, one through the line of Jeconiah, which was cursed, Joseph, and one through Nathan, which was pure, both sons of David. But there is something that I find so enlightening for us as Gentile believers in the gospel or in the genealogy of our Lord and Savior. Turn with me just to Matthew chapter 1 real quick. Again, we were not an afterthought. 
I'm not going to read all the, and Abraham begot, and David begot, and Isaac begot. I don't want to do that this morning. But I do want to point out a couple in here. Matthew chapter 1, first of all, I want you to look at verse 3. Then Judas begot Perez and Zerah of Tamar. How many of you guys remember who Tamar was? That was his daughter-in-law. Right? Remember she had to trick him and go play the harlot so that he would lie with her? And then she became impregnated. He gave, her, he gave his signet ring to her. And then later on she comes out and she's like, um, I'm pregnant by the guy who gave me this. And he's like, oh, psh, everybody go away. Okay, let's talk. <laughs> right? Of course I'm paraphrasing. That's not what the Bible says. Right? But nonetheless, okay, we see, first of all, Tamar. A woman of, if you would, ill-begotten character according to, to, to her father-in-law. A woman who was deceitful. Interesting. Continuing on. Let's look at verse 5. And Solomon begot Boaz of Rahab. And Boaz... Oh, we can pause there. Rahab. How many guys remember who Rahab was? Right? The harlot. Enough said. And Boaz begot Obed of Ruth, a Moabitess, a Gentile. You remember Ruth, right? And Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, took a Gentile bride to redeem. To redeem. Just an interesting thought for you. And then jumping down through verse 6, it says, Jesse begot David, the king. And David begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Four women mentioned in that genealogy, all of which were probably women of ill repute. Two of which we know were, were, were Gentiles. He was thinking about us then too. All right? Lest we thought we had to have this perfect lineage and this perfect life. One of the biggest frustrations I have with sharing the gospel with people is when they tell me, well, once I get my life straightened up, I'll come to the Lord. <coughs> really? Good luck with that one. Right? You know, I spent many years trying to straighten up my life. I moved to Las Vegas thinking I was starting all over straightening up my life. Didn't work out, in case you're curious. <laughs> all right? Now, what did happen, though, is my, is my Savior took me in my worst moment down there and brought me the gospel. And I accepted it. And I was set free, and I was released, and I was redeemed, and I had good news. You know, one of the things I love about new believers the most is a new believer doesn't get all worried about all the theologies and doctrines and stuff like that, do they? Right? A new believer doesn't get wrapped up in what they should know in the Bible and what they don't know in the Bible. What a new believer knows is exactly what John talks about. It says, I love you, little children. Why? Because you know him who has saved you. In other words, all they know is they're saved, they're going to heaven, and they don't care. That's why I love being around new believers. They put a fire in me that's so exciting. It makes me want to share the gospel. Why? Because they understand they're redeemed. They understand the simplicity of it. They understand that God had to shut the door and that they can't do anything about it. But sometimes as we make our walk with Christ, we get a little confused and think we have something else to add to this. Oh, I've got to go to church on so every Sunday. By the way, we want you here every Sunday and not because you have to go here for your salvation, because we love to have fellowship with you. Right? And we hope you get fed some. But it's not about what we did. And this is the beautiful thing about a new believer. And new believers tell everybody about Jesus. Because they understand what they've been forgiven from. Now, you guys remember when, we, when Sean and I gave our pledge. Well, some of you will remember. Some of you obviously weren't here. When Sean and I pledged our membership at this church, to give our testimony as we do with everybody. Right? Okay, and you'll remember I shared my testimony and it's all fanciful and people go, oh, that's so neat, right? That God took a sinner like you and saved him. Yes, praise God, took a sinner like me and saved him, all right? And I know it's all, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's the, the, if you would, it's the one that people want to hear about because it's the neat one, right? Because God can take somebody who is so decrepit and wretched and save him. But I want you to understand something about the good news we have. The good news we have this morning is that our God doesn't forget us. And he doesn't let us go. 
my wife grew up in, in a believing house for the most part. And she became a believer at a pretty young age. And she used to get so upset when we had to share our testimony. People said, mine's so boring. <laughs> Your testimony's so neat. People want to hear that. Mine's boring. I like idea. Well, pretty much I grew up in a house that believed in Jesus and I came to the Lord as my Savior and that's it. <laughs> and it's boring. No, you don't get it. That's the gospel. Because he can keep you from a young age, and then when he takes me from an older age, he can keep me too. He's not going to let me go. Why? If he's going to let somebody go, he should let me go before he lets my wife go, right? And if he hasn't let her go, then why would he let me go? He shut me in. He closed the door, and I stand here secured in my salvation. I don't ever question that. One of the most difficult things is lately I've been having to spend some time um, visiting with a brother um, who, who has been struggling with his salvation and his assurance of salvation. And I have to admit, I weep every time he says, I don't know that I'm saved. And we go over his testimony again. We go over the salvation story again. We go over the gospel again. And I tell him, and finally the Lord gave me this. And I told him, I sat down with him. And I told him, I said, listen, every time the enemy comes at you and says, are you saved? You look at him and say, the door's been shut. End of discussion. Because you are. If you've placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, you trusted him as your savior, that is it. It says we have the faith of a little child. A little child doesn't understand all the things that we should behave like or be like, right? Little children are honest, right? I remember dear Rose coming up to me, one of her first Sundays here, and she says, you're fat. <laughs> she wasn't lying. Right? Now, of course, it didn't do much for my confidence, but that's okay. All right? And I'm not embarrassed by that. I'm not upset about that. And I said, why, thank you. You're pretty. Okay? But children are honest. It's simple for them, isn't it? But then as we go along, for some reason, we try to make it something more than it is. And that's not what it is. It is that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was risen again, and if we've placed our faith in that completed work of the cross and his resurrection, we are saved. End of discussion. Door is closed. Leave me alone. Now, I would be remiss if I sent you out of here with just those words. Because I do need to tell you. He says he sets us free from sin. I want you to catch those words. He sets us free from sin. Do you understand that if you are not a believer, when you sin, you're just following your nature? You're doing what you, you know how to do. That's all you know how to do. But if you've placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you sin, you're going against your nature. Because he set you free. They train elephants in the circus with a chain to begin with in life. They take a baby elephant, they put a big chain around its ankle, and they drive a stake in the ground so that elephant can pull against it and try to get away. And it can't. It can't. And then did you know by the time that that elephant starts to grow and has been chained up for so many years, that eventually they can actually just take a little thin rope, tie it around the ankle of that elephant, put it to a stake in the ground, and that elephant will not pull against it and set itself free. See, this is how we were before we came to the Lord Jesus Christ. We were trained by how you've been set free from sin. You no longer have to do it. Amen. It's not your nature anymore. That's the good news. You don't have to fall into that trap anymore. You've been and you've been set free. Now go out and live like it. And go out and live like it. Don't beat yourself up when you stumble. You guys have seen me walk. I stumble a lot. Maybe not as much as Raleigh, but a lot. <laughs> All right? But you know what? You got to get back up. Because you, you may have stumbled, yes, but it doesn't control you. It's not tied to your ankle. It's not holding you there anymore. You're free. Get back up and keep going. How simple is this gospel we have? The Apostle Paul in Acts, I'm going to close with this, guys. Actually, that's not true. I'm going to close with two things here. 
so I'm kind of lying to you. Well, I didn't really lie to you because I corrected myself. <laughs> Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul. You guys remember this. Basically, Apostle Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas are in jail. There's a big earthquake, and the, get, the gates open up, and the Roman guard is getting ready to kill himself because he thinks all the prisoners have gotten away. Right? And it says, Paul cried with a loud voice. This is verse 28, in case you're there. Acts 16, 28. And Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now that's the question, isn't it? And look at the answer. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy household. Believe. Place your faith in. Place your trust in. That's what pistio in the Greek means, just to place your faith in it. You all placed faith in the chairs this morning when you sat down. You didn't worry about whether they are going to hold you. You just assumed they would. It's the same way with Jesus. Place your faith in that and understand that he's going to hold you. Trust in that. Trust in that. Now, I don't have it here, and if you were to turn there, you could probably follow along with me a little bit further down. But it says, after he became saved, that he took Paul and Silas to his house, and he cleansed their wounds. Now, first of all, when was he saved? When he believed. But what did he do next? He went and cleansed the wounds. Now, undoubtedly, he, as the jailer, had probably inflicted many of those wounds. And he went and tried to correct that by washing their wounds and tending to them. So, yes, this is as simple as it is. The death and the resurrection saves us. But it's a natural response for us to think, what else must I do? It's a natural response. Now what should I do? And that's okay. Do it. But understand that this is what saves you. This is what saves you. I shared a gospel message. My, my grandmother was sitting in the audience one time. I shared the gospel message. And my grandmother came, actually, the next time we were together, we were out at a picnic together. And she said, okay, fine. So I heard what I have to do to be saved. She goes, that I don't have to do works and I don't have to be righteous and all that stuff. She goes, but Brian, you and Shonda are probably some of the most godly people I know. You guys are constantly doing something for the Lord. And by the way, I'm not saying that because I want my head to get bigger. It's big enough as it is. All right? But at least it's still out here. But they asked me, you guys do some of the best things I've ever seen anybody do. I said, yeah, but I don't do that because I need it to be saved. I do that because I am saved. Because I love my Savior and I want to give back to my Savior. And I don't want any other person to go to a place, a destination, hell that was not designed for people. Read that. Matthew was designed for who? It was designed for the devil angels. It wasn't even meant for people. And unfortunately, there's going to be some there.